All right, good afternoon. We're at 12.02, so we are going to get started. Uh, my name is Bradley Flam. I'm the Director of the Office of Sustainability here at Westchester University, and I'd like to welcome all of you here in person and those of you joining us via Zoom to this, the fourth presentation in our uh, Spring 2023 Sustainability Research and Practice Seminar. Our office is proud to co-sponsor this series with the Office for Research and Sponsored Programs and the Sustainability Council's uh, Scholarly and Creative Activities Committee. Please know that we have eight more presentations after uh, today's, and you are welcome to join us at any time. For those of you in person, we have a printed program of the 12 presentations. And for those of you uh, online, you can find the full program at the Office of Sustainability's website uh, on the university's website. Uh, so now without further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming Mr. Joshua Byler. Hello everyone on Zoom and hello everyone in person. Uh, my name is Josh Feiler and today I'm going to be speaking about student advocacy as a catalyst for sustainable and social change. Big thank you to the Office of Sustainability for hosting me. So for kind of an abstract, uh, I just want to say I don't have a PhD. I'm just a student here. So I'm going to be focusing more on the practice part of the sustainability research and practice seminar. And it's really how I've seen student advocacy in practice uh, throughout history I'll be speaking about, but also in my own life and some other recent events. So let me take you back to a time not actually so long ago. So this is five and a half years ago. Uh, this handsome guy is me in freshman year of uh, high school, actually. Uh, I do think you could probably grow a little bit more facial hair, I'll be honest though. But I was a very different person. I, many of you know me as that annoying vegan guy now, but I actually used to eat six eggs every morning, denied climate change, and I would actually make fun of those who champions these issues and would frequently have debates with them on why they were wrong. Now, if we fast forward to today, I'm a senior in college, uh, much better looking facial hair, if you ask me. Um, I've been vegan for nearly five years now, and I help other students advocate for more sustainable and uh, social issues. I also run two sustainability focused clubs. So part of the conversation we're gonna be having today is kind of how I got from point A to point B, um, but that's not the entirety of it. And you'll see what we have in store soon. Um, just for some more background, I just want to give you some uh, information on my involvements. I won't be going all over all this today, but I think it's a key part in understanding kind of my student leadership and student advocacy journey. So um, currently I'm sitting as the president of Veg Out. It's the campus's vegan plant-based club. It's more of a, a social club at this point. A uh, lovely picture of uh, me looking like Chris Kringle there. Um, I'm also the vice president of the investment group. It's not entirely relevant to this conversation today but it's still worth noting as it will be a point I will be bringing up. And I also helped restart um, the chapter of Net Impact Westchester University, which is a club that focuses on business, sustainability, social impact, and the intersections in between us. Um, some other involvements I've had in the past uh, years and also at present, I was a former Dining Services Senator, Student Government Association. I've been able to sit and kind of help out on the Prime Committee, Sustainability Council, Sustainable Food Systems Committee, Golden Ramp Society, but also the Students Against Food Insecurity Initiative, which really took off last year. It was a big uh, part of you know, getting more food um, needs met on campus, and we'll be talking about that a lot as well. But what I really want to focus on, uh, if I can kind of narrow it down, uh, I kind of narrowed it down to three to four main issues I want to be talking about later on in this presentation. So I'll be talking about my student advocacy and the effects I've seen in uh, Fed Jones. So here's or media Thanksgiving with my good friend Devin Brock. Um, I'm going to be talking about net impact and how uh, myself, along with other students, are trying to kind of mobilize the next generation of sustainable and social leaders. Um, but also a big part of my student advocacy journey, and I'm thankful for everyone that's been along with it, um, is kind of the students against food insecurity work that we were able to do last year. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to do as much this year, but I think it's a really important part of uh, my journey, but also this, the journey of student advocacy as a whole in these past couple of years at Westchester. But before we get started into the main bulk of the presentation, just wanted to go over some definitions that I think is important for us all to keep in mind while we uh, take a look through the presentation. So first off, student advocacy, and this is a very rudimentary definition, 
but I kind of define it as students pushing for the things that they want to see in life, uh, whether that be for themselves at a university or just uh, more broader social and sustainable issues. Uh, sustainable change, this is uh, the official definition. It says sustainable change aims for actions and enterprises to cause less or no harm to the natural world and that ecosystems continue to function and generate uh, the conditions necessary for modern society's quality of life to remain intact. Pretty long-winded definition there, but basically I like to sum it down and kind of boil it down to how do we make the world better tomorrow than it was today? And then social change kind of ties into sustainable change in a way, um, but sociologists often define this as uh, changes in human interactions and relationships that are able to transform cultural and social institutions. So this goes more into the food insecurity stuff, but also some other recent initiatives we see on campus. So I'm just want to take all of us kind of on a journey in the past and go through the history of student advocacy. So what we find is that often scholars define student advocacy in a couple of different waves, uh, mainly three waves. So the first wave we see, you know, the 1600s to early 1800s, we often see self-interested riots often in these university campuses or schoolyards, uh, kind of trying to focus on, you know, how can I improve my quality of life to the best of my ability. And the second wave, uh, the 1840s, kind of on to the 1950s, we see stuff that's more focused on charitable efforts or volunteerism. And I'll be speaking about that as well. But third wave is 1950 to the present. It's more uh, issues and student advocacy and student leadership focused on uh, social consciousness, but I'd also kind of postulate that that extends to sustainable issues as well as that kind of ties in with social consciousness. So to speak about the first wave, you might be asking, why is the, see if I can just move this right here. Why is the vegan talking about the butter rebellion? Well, I think it's important to note. Uh, so there's a little known university called Harvard. Um, and then the first recorded student protest at this little known university uh, was in 1766. And this was dubbed the butter rebellion. Students were served what they were called rancid butter. And I wanna just kind of draw parallels to a lot of the issues we've seen last year of students really arguing about the quality of food at the former Lawrence Dining Hall. So know that this is not a new issue and it even happens at larger institutions like Harvard. Um, Henry David Thoreau's grandfather, Asa Dunbar, proclaimed, behold our butter stinketh. Give us therefore butter that stinketh not. I would say, I think this quote might've been buttered up a little bit and it might not have been as, uh, you know, as biblical and grandiose as it sounds. But I just wanted to show that, you know, these riots in, you know, these student advocacy, you know, it, it has history in our nation, in our nation's history, and it's really important. And, you know, this is kind of more the self-interest stuff. And we just see specifically one for one, we want better butter. Um, but those issues will still stay prevalent today. Now, in the second wave, we're going to be talking about the junior league. So this is the story of Mary Rumsey. I hope I'm pronouncing her right name right. But she was a student at Barnard College in 1901. And she was inspired to volunteer after hearing a lecture on the settlement movement. So for those of you who don't know, the settlement movement kind of took hold in the late 1800s, to the 1800s. And what it was, was essentially a group of people that thought, how do we kind of help bridge the economic divide between the classes? And what it ended up being was, it kind of started out in New York, if I believe. And it was, they, it was more middle class and wealthier individuals saying, how can you kind of bring you know, the lower class kind of into the fold? So what they did was they would kind of either relocate themselves into the poorer neighborhoods, or they would, you know, invite the, the poorer people, the lower class into their own homes, into their own gatherings, just kind of say like, hey, we're all people here together and kind of just bridge that economic divide. So that really kind of took hold in the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s. So once Mary heard about this, she was kind of called to action, student advocacy. And what she did was she formed a coalition of female students with a lesser known uh, Eleanor Roosevelt at the time while she was still in her college years. And they wanted to fundraise and do direct service and volunteering uh, in New York kind of what these settlement housing movements. And this, uh, this kind of led to the formation of the Junior League, which is nowadays it's you know, often in a lot of uh, large college campuses and it's typically women that are kind of dedicated to you know, volunteering and helping others out. But it had its you know, kind of humble beginnings with the settlement movement. So again, that is kind of the second wave, as I had said, and that is, is more focused on charitable and volunteering efforts. So now for the third wave. This kind of brings us more to modern day. We have these, in the civil rights era, we see the Greensboro Civic. 
So what this was, was four young African Americans kind of started this off and they went to a kitchen uh, dining area and they sat at a segregated lunch counter, as we all know, um, typically oftentimes in the South, a lot of these uh, establishments would often be labeled as whites only, something like that. Um, but these students wanted to really advocate for themselves and also people like them and of their same color and wanted to be able to eat at these dining halls or eat at these establishments, which today makes a lot of sense. But back then we have to realize you know, there was a lot more prejudices. And so this kind of inspired the sit-in movement and it was able to spread through a lot of college towns in the South. So oftentimes when we think of civil rights, we think of it as kind of just like this grand movement that just kind of happened. But what we find is a lot of these more popularized sit-ins often actually took root, took hold in college campuses. So I think that was just an important point on the civil rights era and just to show student advocacy has been here for a long time. But now moving more towards modern day and this third wave, you see a couple of different types of uh, advocacy. And I also want to show and point out that what I've been showing thus far has been largely protest, mainly because that's often one of the most visible ways of, of uh, student advocacy. But throughout my presentation, I want to note student advocacy comes in lots of uh, shapes and sizes. So it's not just protest, but I think this is a very good visual representation of the different ways. So up here we see the climate marches, which have really taken root, I'm gonna say the mid 2010s to current day. Uh, we often see lots of students kind of mobilizing together and taking a day off from uh, school or maybe a half day and going and protesting for the climate, which realistically directly correlates mostly with the Office of Sustainability, people like to think, because climate change is kind of a very visible issue nowadays. And so what we see is students protesting, why are we studying? Why are we doing our education if in 20, 30 years we believe that the earth, you know, is going to be in a much worse state, you know, and we need to have our educators and, uh, and our administration and our that faculty members and our policymakers really emphasize this issue. But then we also see more of these social issues here. So down here we see um, a, lot, a lot of people often are fighting for against tuition increases for college universities. And this is largely because they might believe that education training would be free or cheaper than it is. And we've seen, uh, especially larger institutions, continue to charge more and more and more for education. And so it's not necessarily as prevalent as you know a state school like Westchester, but it's still, it still definitely is prevalent because a lot of people are always advocating for tuition freezes. So a lot of students uh, are really doing this because they realize in America, the college tuition price is a, an issue. Then over here we see this is actually a more relevant example and more recent. Uh, this is actually at Westchester's campus, whereas the rest of these were um, at different universities. Uh, so this is the kind of the housing protest. So for those of you who don't know, I wasn't really involved with this, but I think it was very uh, necessary to highlight. Um, starting kind of, I want to say last November, or so lots of students were kind of rallying together because when they applied for traditional housing, they were denied access uh, to this housing and were kind of told good luck. Um, and then also even uh, even before that, um, at the start of last semester, we saw a lot of people uh, were accepted to Westchester University, but weren't able to uh, really get into a dorm because the university overbooked um, the students. So what they found is, oh, well, maybe we can just kind of pay off the students. So it, it's a really relevant issue. But then what we see is, you know, kind of a group of students that came together and they said, you know, we're facing homelessness because of the university's policies. We started to make demands and it was a really relevant and recent well-done example of students kind of mobilizing together to try and focus and focus their efforts on making the world a better place. So I'm not going to speak too much on that issue just because I wasn't necessarily directly involved with it, but I think it was really relevant to say. But although there's lots of uh, pros to modern advocacy, uh, there's a lot of cons as well. So I'd like to just say a brief word on that before I kind of go into some of my more uh, relevant examples from my own life. So some pros is that information can disseminate kind of quicker than ever before. We're here virtually on Zoom and we're able to kind of communicate via online, but we also have people in person, but also with student issues, we're able to post it on social media, text our friends, post it on a forum, you know, get it on the news or something. And we've seen that, especially, like I said, with the housing crisis issue, it was able to spread really fast. And even though I wasn't directly involved, I would see it on social media all the time. It got picked up by the news. It was a really quick way to get information. And because of this, it's often we find it's easier for students to get people together for these various causes. 
And so that can be a really great thing because a lot of people are able to mobilize much quicker. But I think one of the main pros of the modern advocacy can also be one of the cons. Since information can disseminate faster than ever before, you also see maybe counter protests. And that's more, in, I want to say, the general political sphere potentially. But you're able to see, you know, people are able to kind of counter your point. So there might be a climate strike. There also might be, you know, direct opposite of that. We see people saying, you know, no, we want to keep the oil pipelines up, just as an example. Um, I also think it's worth noting that in modern advocacy, we often see a rise of performative activism. So what that means is uh, a specific definition of that is, you know, often it's activism that's done for the intent of raising one's own social capital rather than the actual movement itself. I think that was kind of really relevant in uh, say the Black Lives Matter protests that we saw a lot of students kind of engage in. Not to say that it wasn't important, which it definitely was, but a lot of students it seemed would just kind of take pictures of themselves at the riots and would post on Instagram kind of to get the likes versus actually getting their hands in, you know, kind of in the dirt and really working to kind of mobilize the next generation of leaders in that space. So I think that's just an interesting point to add, especially in, we say like with climate issues, as much as it is important to spread information on social media, I don't think it's really enough just for students to be posting, oh, we have to make a change on their Instagram stories and then continue living their lives as they typically do. Um, but beyond performative activism, what we also see is reduced dialogue because, because information can spread so much. Often what we see is people are able to hold what uh, some scholars actually are called luxury beliefs, such as climate change denial. Because often say if the United States, we're able to live in our nice homes, turn on the lights regardless at the end of the night. Uh, and we don't really see the firsthand impacts of monsoons and earthquakes on say more coastal areas or more like uh, areas that are closer uh, to the ocean, for example. Um, so just reduce dialogue because oftentimes we're kind of fighting and that's often mainly in America, largely due to the political differences, stuff like that. And that can often lead to the us versus them mentality, which I'm sure we're all aware of. And I've even seen it kind of happen a few times in some of the discussions I've been having here um, or been watching with the research and practice seminar. Uh, not to say that's anyone's issue, but someone will often present and will say, or someone will raise a question, well, how can we get the other side to see our issue? And, or how can we get climate change deniers to accept our, you know, our hypothesis or something like that? And while it's still very important, I think it, what it does is it kind of, you know, pushes them, uh, other people into another camp. See, I just did it myself, I called them that. You know, push, it, push them into another camp and we're in, in reality, we're all kind of trying to, we should be all trying to solve these issues together and bring them, you know, kind of into a kind of a collective, if, if I will. So that's a very rudimentary definition of uh, us versus them. But I just thought it was important to kind of have these notes on modern advocacy because it's, especially in the internet age, we see a lot of different uh, challenges and, but also pros. So now I'm gonna be taking us through kind of my uh, sustainability journey. And I want to say it's kind of student advocacy through my eyes. And I will say often this does come in the form of student leadership, but I think that they kind of go hand in hand. And I hope my presentation will demonstrate that. So first off, I want to start with the beginning of my college career, which is uh, summer 2020 and spring 2021. Although I may be graduating uh, this semester, I actually, um, like many people, graduated uh, kind of Zoom high school or, and then went directly into Zoom University at uh, Bucks County Community College. So there's a, a very hairy version of myself, of those many of you may have met me um, a while back when I looked like a lumberjack, um, but it kind of started out with Zoom classes and stuff like that. And I wanted to get involved in clubs at Bucks, but due to the pandemic, much like at Westchester, I heard there really was nothing. Students were mobilizing. They're more worried about Will I be able to afford rent? Where am I getting food? There's no toilet paper at Target down the street. Um, and so what I realized was there's a big issue here. I also want to say in high school, I didn't really do any student advocacy. I wasn't involved in any extracurriculars at all. All I did was really work and focus on my, uh, you know, say uh, extra, not extracurriculars, but schoolwork. Um, but once we got to my graduation here when I was Mr. Lumberjack, I realized, you know, I want to kind of come in to Westchester when I transfer in, and I realized that people will be missing that human connection. And that's kind of a theme that I want to talk about through my entire presentation. So if you see this last picture here, this is actually uh, 
much like it seems like many college boys do, I messaged Fedge out and said, send you a DM. And I was actually able to become president of Veg Out before I even was an official student of the university, which is uh, maybe not actually allowed, but here we are. Um, so all this to say, I, this is kind of a good preface to my time here at Westchester in the past uh, three or so semesters. And what I really want to emphasize with this point is, you know, how did, you know, kind of university students, but also faculty members move from online back into in-person. A lot of people focus on moving from the in-person to online, but how did that dialogue around student advocacy, you know, human relationships change when we move from online to in-person? So now we're moving to fall of 2021. And as I said, when I kind of came into VegOut specifically, I really wanted to make a place where people kind of felt at home and were able to communicate with each other about, say, veganism, plant-based uh, nutrition, as I didn't have a single vegan friend up until I came to this university. And I realized many students probably don't have that as well. So here's an example of just uh, a vegan Thanksgiving, everyone was able to come together and get access to nutritional food. But that's not what I'm going to focus on in this slide right here. What I want to focus on is this is kind of the start of my I want to say my advocacy journey in the more traditional sense with in regards to food insecurity. So because of my role as president of that job, I was approached by multiple students asking for help in a food insecurity town hall. And I wasn't really aware of food insecurity. Some of you may be, as uh, Dr. Seth Jacobson, I believe, gave a talk on that very issue a couple semesters ago before I had started. Um, so basic need insecurity, stuff like that. But I realized, you know, these students are approaching me for my help. And how can I kind of help them out. And, but it was students from a really diverse background, which I want to really point out. We had students from the Muslim uh, Student Association, the Hillel Jewish Student Union, uh, Black Student Union, Bejal members of the, the SGA, um, also from the Center for Civic Engagement. And we had all these students kind of come together and realize like, how can we go about this? So we kind of started having conversations with ourselves and it ultimately led up to um, having a town hall kind of based on food insecurity, how students themselves can access um, these different uh, resources on campus, such as the resource pantry, as you can see in my picture with uh, Seth Jacobson here, so we can go on their track. Um, and this kind of conversation kind of sparks kind of a journey into how do we help mobilize these students who might not be um, facing some of the issues potentially we are, because I was very fortunate to never have to experience food insecurity in my life, but I said, how can I, help along with others, help those who are experiencing that so that they can have all the same kind of advantages and privileges that I have. So what happened then is we started talking with faculty members. Um, we had talked with PASHI uh, consultants for the entire state. We talked with um, other students um, and you know, administrators here. How can they focus on improving this? And at the time, some of you are new students. Um, we were in the Lawrence Dining Hall. And there's a lot of complaints about the quality of food, cost of food, stuff like that. And so this kind of began my journey into the students against food insecurity in realm, if you will. So now to move on to spring 2022, uh, this is when stuff started to really take hold um, with the help of some uh, faculty members, such as uh, Ashley Delshed, I don't know if she's on the call here. Uh, we are able to go to Harrisburg and kind of as a collective, you know, students here from lots of different groups that I had mentioned before, but also other students just interested in helping out. Uh, we were able to go to Harrisburg with the help of Swipe Out Hunger to advocate for the, uh, the Hunger Free Campus Bill, which is actually uh, put into kind of proposed by uh, the local Senator uh, Carolyn Kinnett. And but what we found is there was over 100 students from all over the state. We had students from University of Pennsylvania, Temple. I think we also had students from University of Pittsburgh all across the state going to Harrisburg, kind of the lobby, talk to our local, um, local workers and uh, local government to try and you know, fix this issue. And so that's kind of a more direct kind of correlation of, or example rather, of student advocacy. You, know, you have an issue and you go and lobby for it. You know? So we have just some pictures here, you know, I was talking with assistants uh, on the town hall, and we were able to meet um, the former first lady, Lady Frances Wolf, and you know, here's some really great speeches. And then this kind of all came to fruition later on, which we can kind of speak a little bit more about. So that's more just the student advocacy part um, for the students against food insecurity, and there will be a success story later on. But with this, I also started to realize that I can utilize VegOut specifically as a student advocacy tool in my own right 
because student advocacy can also come through student leadership, as I mentioned, mainly through building relationships with others, which I'll touch more, more on later. But a big issue with, I find a lot of sustainable issues is we aren't focused on building a community. And that's what I really want to do here. So with my work in Bedjam, along with the help of others, we were able to do cooking demonstrations for students on how to create you know, cheap and effective vegan meals on campus. Uh, so we did, and we worked with uh, Dr. Subak to put that in a new building, the new SECC. Um, and that was a great event, bringing people together, also just making friendships. Uh, we have other kind of uh, more simpler events, but still very needed community based around yoga and then a vegan pub. And it's all coming together, focusing on how do we have environmentally friendly food, but also do stuff that's good for our body. But also in that time, and also with my role as a student uh, government uh, senator, as a dining services uh, senator, I was able to work with Airmark. And so this is in the former dining hall at Lawrence, but we were able to get kind of a, a vegan booth in a way. And now there's a permanent vegan booth, which is a great success. And I'm very fortunate that they implemented that. But before they didn't have that, and we were able to kind of do a collaboration between VegOps and Airmark to get students a free uh, vegan meal that they could sign up for a voucher. And so that was a great time. But also through my work with actually the food insecurity stuff, I was able to work a lot with the former director of student involvement, uh, Dr. Leah Tobin. And she had a college connection at her time in university, who ended up being a vegan venture capitalist. And as a finance major, I promise my finance background will come into play at some point in this presentation. Uh, we had uh, this guy named David Benzik come down to New York City to speak on vegan venture capital, but also just inform students who might be more finance oriented rather than sustainability oriented. You know, what is the kind of effect of the different food we're using? And I know some of you were able to come to that presentation and it was a great time. We had over a hundred people come out and these are a hundred people who might not be coming to presentations like say this research and practice seminar. So it's a great way to kind of disseminate information and get people to learn about it. And I'm actually working under him right now, which is uh, a really awesome fact. Um, but now kind of moving to more recently. So uh, this is, I wasn't able to do as much with Swipe Out Hunger and food insecurity initiatives, but it did kind of take ahead. Uh, and it kind of all came together as uh, Westchester University was awarded $54,000 um, from, the, from the PA state government um, for their food and security initiatives from that hunger free campus bill. So it did get signed into law. And also we did our first ever Swipe Out Hunger food drive. So what Swipe Out Hunger is, it focuses on students donating their unused meal swipes and to have it go towards students facing food insecurity. And this was a very visible way to kind of uh, one for one, it's easy for students to become a student advocate in their own right by donating the meal swipes. So again, with the help of Dr. Ashley Delshev, you're able to uh, get swipe out on your food drive set up. I'm not taking credit for this myself by any means. I'm just saying I was able to play a small part in this and I'm very fortunate. And that again is a more traditional sense of student advocacy. And then over here we have, we did again on a very vegan Thanksgiving. This is just a way for our students to be able to try and get you know, free access to vegan food, because especially if we're talking about food insecurity all the time, many people are just worried to get about getting any food, and then they worry, oh, I don't want to have to worry about getting sustainably sourced or vegan food. So it's, again, how do we have these students kind of come together, form a community around these different sustainability and food-related ideas. But also, as I had mentioned, I had, re I had started up Net Impact Westchester University chapter, which is a global chapter, uh, a global uh, student organization that kind of brings students together and tries to mobilize them. And so with this, we were able to do really interesting collaboration, say with the investment group, which I also run, we were able to talk about impact investing. So if we're already going to be doing investing on campus, we might as well find students who might not be thinking about sustainability and focus on them to make sure that they are more about how can they, you know, kind of vote with their dollar in a way. But also we were able to have a really cool guest speaker about such as Joseph Delker, who focuses on helping uh, mid-career individuals transition into a green career as the green economy especially takes off. So he was able to give us you know, spe specific tips on how to kind of, you know, advocate for ourselves moving forward in a green career. So I'm just going to pause here for a second. So all these three pictures specifically might not seem like student advocacy in its typical sense. I really want to equate student leadership to, to student advocacy, mainly because we're teaching students about sustainable issues, uh, social issues, as they might not be taught these in their typical classes. I'll say specifically as a finance student, 
I only have had two classes that even really mentioned sustainability at all. Business and Society, which is taught by Matt Caulfield, who has been the speech here, so he did a great job of that. And Environmental Economics, which I took as an elective, which seemed, uh, it was just an interesting topic by our now advisor, Matt McCann, for net impact. But that's all to say is we focus so much in the Office of Sustainability or the Prime Committee of, you know, oh, we're, we're having more sustainable focused education. And yet often students who are not in your traditional sustainability makers of urban planning or environmental science or biology might not really be thinking about these issues at all. So how do we, you know, kind of create and fill that gap of, uh, you know, the lack of information and focus on students who might be kind of underserved in the sustainability and social change area and make sure they're able to be brought to the fold of what this, of the university is trying to do as well. So now to kind of move to the present and the future. The semester has just started, so it's not, uh, I don't have too many updates for you yet on some of my initiatives. But what we have been able to do thus far is have, say, global think tanks from so a group called Good Food Institute, which focuses on alternative protein development. So that's plant based meat, how do we, or cultivated meat, but how do we take a cell from an animal and create uh, the same cell for cell meat, which in a way makes it more sustainable, the animal doesn't have to die and focuses on the future of food, basically. So we're able to have a guest speaker speak on that issue. And that's a topic that most universities aren't covering at all. So it's great that a smaller state school is able to even get that information out uh, through Net Impact and uh, fed out some of my other groups. We're able to have the first ever uh, plant-based and climate uh, sector focused ETF on the New York Stock Exchange uh, come out. ETF, just imagine for those who don't know, kind of just imagine kind of a bundle of stocks. Um, come out and uh, speak virtually with us, a fund manager and a CEO. But what's cool about this is it's the first ever ETF that's carbon neutral without buying carbon credits. And that's a, that's a, that was kind of an abstract thing I learned in environmental economics that we might speak about, but it's really cool that we have actual speakers that are able to come out and speak about this issue. As again, it's a lot of times we don't have speakers that are necessarily coming out that are directly relating to what students are learning in class. I also want to emphasize since uh, this is kind of a collaborative nature, we're also able to reach students who might not be, you know, focused on sustainability, such as students in the investment group. And we also have, uh, say, uh, a speaker coming out from the U.S. Housing, excuse me, U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, um, a colleague of Matt McNams, uh, to speak about the decarbonization of the transportation sector. So these are just some ways of uh, I'm trying to initiate in my own student leadership journey uh, this semester and moving forward. How can we make you know, sustainable and social change? So I do have some takeaways here. So again, I wanna kind of show how student leadership and student advocacy can kind of be the same thing. Because thus far I've talked a lot about my own experiences in student leadership, but I wanna show that it in a way it is student advocacy in my own eyes, because through developing friendships, I've had friends go vegetarian. I've had friends realize that they need to eat more sustainable. So they eat more plant-based on a couple of days of the week or, and that's largely a result due to kind of the social interactions we've been able to have in veg out. And it wasn't actually a, re a result of say, posting something on social media or, you know, going on campus and smearing blood on the Rannick statue and say, meat is murder or something like that. That's through this kind of advocacy that we try and do in our own clubs. Um, but it, I view, so that's all to say that I view both of my uh, times here, uh, either with students against food insecurity or at Veg Out, as almost equally important because one is much more uh, visible and oh, it's more quantitative. And we got $54,000 to the university to help food insecurity initiatives. But on the other side, we have to focus on those relationships as well. So some key takeaways. Uh, with your advocacy, I really want to encourage everyone to build community. I've just been alluding to a lot about relationships. But in these clubs and with my advocacy, I've seen lots of beautiful friendships born, not just only for myself, but for other students who have been able to say meet their best friends in the space. And what this allows, obviously, it's, it helps out with just loneliness in college, but it helps you find more sustainable-minded individuals and that way you're going to be able to submit information between yourselves and in your own careers later on, kind of advocate for sustainable issues and kind of create that community. And what I find is we have uh, just oftentimes these sustainable issues are kind of just seem so abstract. Like, you know, what, as I said before, when I was a freshman in high school, 
uh, 2050 or so, we're all going to be dead from climate change or something like that. And it was kind of just like, uh, okay, like what does that mean? But seeing the community at work and di different issues, focusing on them, has been a great way to uh, just kind of build my own advocacy, but also others. We had a guest speaker come out um, for all the leadership uh, students on campus. She said, with your student organizations, be in the business of building relationships, not events. And I've really taken that to heart and tried to make sure with our advocacy, we're trying to make those around us better, but just build a community as a whole. So that's my takeaway number one. And my takeaway number two is that we have to realize the intersectionality of these advocacy issues. So as much as I talked about the food and security work, I realized, should I really be promoting veganism say, or eating more plant-based if there's a lot of students who are just worried about putting food on the table at all, you know, or, or worrying about where's their next meal coming from, or non-traditional students who might have a family and think, oh, this vegan food might be too expensive. So I realized I had to kind of take my own experience and kind of toss that aside because I've had a very supportive family that's helped me through that and realize, how can we focus on helping students just put food on the table and then realize Oh, you know, the students that helped me might have, they were in veg out. What is plant-based living? What is that type of thing? And to form a more positive relationship or positive thoughts about that, because oftentimes, like the, my old self or my little freshman self would bully vegans because I heard of, oh, vegans are going crazy or whatever. But I wanted to show that, you know, we have to make sure and realize that all these issues are intersectional and how they go together. And even with, say, net impacts, we focus a lot on student advocacy in this presentation and the Office of Sustainability to focus on students, but what comes after college? And so building in your future is a really important topic as well. So takeaway number three, always advocate for the future that you want to see. This is mainly because I say this because, say, for example, the vegan club here, I didn't have that in my past, as I was saying. I really wanted to have a place and create a community where I could have those types of friends and talk about sustainability and plant-based living. And often what I find is if you don't advocate for this stuff yourself, no one else will. And not to say that that will always happen, but if you see an issue, and I know we have lots of different issues in here. I know some people advocate, say, for the Green Fund, for example. Oftentimes, we don't see other students advocating. So you have to be, ad, be the advocate that you want to be, advocate for the future you want to see because life is too short not to, is my, is my take. Takeaway number four, advocacy might not happen in the way you think it will. I did not plan on hosting a town hall with multiple different religious student groups as myself, a non-believer, but what ended up happening was through my advocacy work in the bedroom, I was able to kind of come into the fold. And so realize that your journey might not be as, you know, set in stone as you think it is. It might not be um, as you know, visible as some of the other protests we see. Uh, well, we're gonna kind of come together, we're gonna protest and we'll get it done. It's, it's not always like that, but that doesn't mean that your student advocacy is still not important. So that's my takeaway number four. Takeaway number five is to be patient with people. I will say I'm not always uh, the, the best at this, but I will definitely work where I can. Uh, being the finance uh, and uh, business student that I am, I of course had to plug my own LinkedIn. Um, and on LinkedIn, there was a post from this uh, a leader in the alternative protein space, kind of talking about why are we in the community, you know, why are we bullying each other? And I see this a lot, say, in the vegan space, but even the sustainability space, we see, you, know, we, you don't use enough reusable bags. Well, that's a plastic straw. I mean, I guess you don't champion these issues the same way I do, or something like that. Uh, so to kind of quote myself, I said, although I hold steadfast to about the vegan, I love for everyone to live vegan. Uh, I found that, you know, when running my student organization, that I've been able to sway more people to eat more plant-based by encouraging this positive and open discourse, kind of like we're having right now, open discussions, rather than attacking others. And I will say, attacking others can feel nice sometimes, but that's not what we should be doing. We should be focusing to bring everyone in the fold, create friendships, stuff like that. Uh, we have seen explosive growth because of it. Um, because we open up to everyone. I'm not checking your vegan card when you come to veg out. I'm saying, hey, if you're in the local community, sure, come out. Um, and we've been able to grow a lot. And then uh, a commenter, uh, who I, I don't really know, but Harriet said, when you present people with a lot of nothing, you usually get nothing. So we should applaud and support uh, any movement, whether, uh, although it might be incremental, towards say plant-based seating, but that can also be extended to just sustainability in general. Of course, we should still advocate for people to be as sustainable as they can, but we should have people focus on doing what they can.
So to kind of close out here, I just want to show this journey of student advocacy in my life is kind of the scene from where I was as a freshman to now. I will say very honestly, I used to argue, say, with feminists and say that their issues were stupid. And now I was like, what was I talking about? Or I would make fun of people who focus on sustainable issues. And I realized this kind of because it kind of goes to my takeaways because there's people that were patient with me and were allowed and saw, okay, he might be able to be an advocate. Let's let's push him a little bit, but not, let's not make fun of him or ostracize him. And I think just encouraging and promoting open dialogue in today's society will help a lot of people kind of come from where I was to where I am now. And hopefully I can see that. And then I just want to quote, um, one, I might have made an inflammatory comment in one of my uh, sessions as a student advocate here, kind of pushing really hard because I was like, so gun ho on an issue and I kind of hurt some feelings. So it was uh, Dr. Leia Tobin took me aside and kind of had to talk to me. And she said, you can send the old adage of, you can catch more flies with honey uh, than with vinegar. And I think that's really true as we want to be you know, patient and sweet with people. But I will say, as vegan, I think we should replace this statement with uh, agave nectar. You can catch more flies with agave nectar uh, than with vinegar. So that's what I have for today's presentation. I would uh, just like to thank everyone for listening. Just hopefully my journey as a student advocate, student leader has inspired some of you. I don't want to make it kind of necessarily all about myself as I'm just a small part of the sustainability mission here, stuff like that. But what's better than uh, kind of focusing more on the practice part of research and practice seminar to see how we've been able to see kind of sustainable change and sustainable innovation and social change in our own campus kind of through my own work. So again, that's all I have. I'm just going to thank you again and open it up to any Q&A here as we're at almost at uh, 12.44. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, of course. Could you repeat it to the Zoom? Folks? Yeah, so uh, we had a question in the back uh, from Lindsay, and she said, uh, what, are, what are some of my thoughts on uh, club collaboration uh, with some maybe non sustainable minded clubs? So I kind of alluded to a little bit, uh, I think it's a great question, um, with my work in the investment group. Uh, you know, that's a group that just focuses on two equity based funds, and it's more just traditional investing. You know, how do we get our, our money to grow? But I really wanted to say, and, you know, along with my vice president, Desmond Brock, how we bring more sustainable issues into this fold. So we had a um, meeting on impact investing last semester, as I said, but one of those uh, that vegan and plant-based and climate change focused ETF is with the investment group as well. But we've also seen with other club collaborations on, say, the religious student groups, we get them to focus more on sustainable issues, saying, yeah, as the Muslim Student Association and Jewish Student Union, we're focusing a lot on halal and kosher eating on campus, which is definitely a big important as we kind of you know, cater towards multiple different beliefs. But what we found is a lot of plant-based food, for example, sustainable minded food is already kosher and halal. And so it was kind of interesting to see those intersections of what might just be kind of seen as, oh, it's just vegetables or stuff like that, but it can actually be certified halal and kosher in their religion. And that makes it kind of easy one for one. How would we advocate for more vegan food on campus in a way that Sometimes, not always, as I'm not either Jewish or Muslim myself, so I don't know all the intricacies of halal and uh, kosher eating, but it can kind of help promote those. But even just something simple as like we had an art club uh, collaboration, you're able to paint uh, reusable bags, something like that. It's great about like 80 people come out and people came away with a reusable bag and we're able to focus on, you know, oh, well, I don't need to get the plastic bag. So hopefully that answers your question uh, a little bit. Definitely open some more collaboration in the future, but I think bringing uh, different issues in from all over the place and different types of people, and you're able to kind of grow that sustainability movement and social impact movement. Uh, I saw another question over here. Yeah, um, there's so much I want to say. Uh, I'm well, first of all, thank you. Uh, my name is Sean. Sean I, I, I think we might have met. Sure we've there. actually officially met uh, one of the interns for the office of our town. I just want to start by saying thank you for your advocacy. I also noticed that you yourself in the beginning of the presentation um, and you did the comment that I'm just a student and I would like to say that you're much more than just a student. Um, in the institution of higher ed, sure, letters next to your name are significant in some ways, although uh, truthfully, as you've shown, the work that we've done in the advocacy uh, component of your 
over here, here because it's too small. It's really powerful. And so I just don't want to sell yourself short. Um, you've done a lot of great work and uh, it's really, it's really wonderful. I just want to push back on uh, one of the slides where uh, you had uh, talked about uh, how advocacy does not lead to dialogue. Uh, and I would say that uh, it's really, the, I feel like it's the only way that you start to have the dialogue. Uh, I think what's important is to think about the systems that we create that force the advocacy, right? So it's thinking on a higher level of why do we have these systems in place that are making people need to advocate for certain things. Um, so I just, I, I feel like that's important. I wanted to express that. Uh, and yeah, I think it's uh, also really wonderful how you figured out a way to navigate through all of these existing systems that we do have, because obviously they're there for a reason. We can talk way more about that, but um, I do think it's really incredible how you found a way to navigate through uh, and still all the while advocate for different things. Um, and then of course, I'd be remiss to say that last question is you mentioned the Green Fund at the end of your, at your presentation. But I would love to uh, leave that with you and get you to sign that. I'm not turning it in. It's the end of this semester. But thank you, Josh. Of course. I want to say uh, on that point with the reduced dialogue, I think it was more so I'm saying that advocacy doesn't lead to dialogue. It's more so because there's almost so much advocacy and so much spread of information. That's where you know people can hold those luxury beliefs. Because um, I know before, as I was saying, uh, when I was a younger student in high school, I kind of held, held those luxury beliefs of like well, climate change is kind of just bullshit basically and because i wasn't directly impacted by it and but you know you go to instagram you go to youtube it's an echo chamber of your own beliefs and that can lead to yes there's dialogue but <laughs> i don't want to have dialogue with the people that disagree with me i want to have dialogue with the people that agree with me so i think that was more my point um and also to uh everyone on zoom uh what sean said was uh that don't discount yourself for being a student. I think it was more just me uh, trying to give a quick quip on how often most of these presentations are done by someone in academia. Um, but just to know that you have power as a student, uh, whether it be uh, in uh, your university, but also uh, once you move beyond university and you're a full-fledged citizen, you know, keep advocating. So, and also sign the Green Fund petition, is what he said. Yes, Brad. Uh, Dr. Wanko has a question she put in the chat, but you might invite her to unmute herself. Then. Yes, uh, Dr. Wanko, you can unmute yourself, or I'm going to bring it up here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it looks like, uh, say something real quick so we can make sure we well, can. <laughs> yeah, I'll just say it, because I, as I uh, put it up there, I realized it's uh, less of a question and more of a plea for help. Um, and so, you know, I run the curriculum committee for the, you know, sustainability council and there are, you know, very devoted um, folks who work really hard. Um, and I, you know, I just was, was struck by your point about, you know, you only encountered this stuff in two classes and that's something that really frustrates us as well. Um, and it has to do with, you know, the committee and the, the people involved, like, you know, we would love to visit every department and give a little spiel, but, you know, limited time, kind of like, you know, for students, right? Um, and also, you know, the other reasons our faculty may not see how it links to their, um, you know, their discipline. And so, and then they don't take the extra step of like finding out. Um, and some are resistant, right? Or some say, oh, I got to teach all this content. I can't add the sustainability stuff. So I guess my plea for help is, and, and question is, do you see any ways in which student advocacy could move into the curriculum in this way and like help us with this work of making sure this stuff is infused like across all majors and all departments? I have I a, ideas. Yeah, I think uh, some of the audience actually, do you have a point to that question? Yeah. Do you want to come up and say it real quick? Uh, Lindsay in the back has kind of a point to that and then I'll kind of say uh, my point or something. Hi, so um, I think it also comes down to um, students realizing that they have power and coming to the correct departments and saying these are things that we want to see. Um, I was talking with someone in the geography department about how a lot of times our role in the business school leads to a huge focus on business geography, business GIS, location analytics, 
Um, and we really find passion in biogeography and applying sustainability um, to geography um, and environmental processes at local scales. Um, and my professor noted he has been to the department many times, um, but it really takes is us students to also support that message that he's bringing to them. Um, so I also have come to the department and, you know, kind of made note of um, how that's where a lot of students do find application within the program um, and to kind of just expand on this, like supporting professors, um, you know, wanting to see that in the curriculum. So I think it's like collaboration between um, faculty and students. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for those thoughts. And then to my point, uh, with one of those people, I think I'd actually email you about him, uh, Dr. Joseph Gelfer, the guy who's helping people trying to transition into the green economy. Uh, a point he made um, that I think can kind of extend to say professors and different majors is in the future, there will be no green economy. It needs to just be the economy. And so he kind of talked about other things such as like project drawdown it's, and stuff like that. It's like, how do we say, this is more, you know, professionally speaking, maybe say in the private sector, how do we make not, you know, sustainable jobs for the future? How do we make our jobs sustainable? You know, so if you're an education major, we need to emphasize you have a lot of power over young minds of America. How do we, you know, implement and just maybe talk even just kind of like off the cuff of here's what sustainability means to me in my classroom or in my own life. Um, but something say like uh, finance, you know, uh, for my thesis topic, I was able to pick um, an analysis of ESG factors in uh, the stock market performance. So there's definitely some stuff that's kind of coming into these classes, but I think it's just to show sustainability, like it's not just like another thing. It's like, it is the thing and it's the future because it has to be or else we're all screwed basically. So in English, if uh, say someone's an English teacher or uh, an English major or something, it's how do we learn about writing grant proposals um, for more sustainable systems or something like that. Oh yeah. So I think it's more so how do we, like, kind of like you said, make people realize the importance of it in their profession. I do think we're making uh, a great stride since we had like the new minor and everything. I wasn't able to take it myself uh, since I'm graduating year early, um, but I think it's definitely a big change. And I see in other institutions that they have like a sustainable master's degrees, stuff like that. But I don't even think we should have to have sustainable master's degrees, um, you know, be the only thing. It's how do we do it in your own profession, uh, so to speak, or even say like if you in healthcare. Uh, a lot of hospitals, um, typically, I was like kind of struck as my grandfather recently had a stroke, thankfully he's okay. But I mean, they're bringing in, you know, two Diet Cokes, a hamburger to a dying patient or something, or someone who's trying to get better. And I'm thinking to myself, why can't we not replicate kind of what the New York hospitals recently did and implement more plant-based options? And it's because it can help health outcomes and it's more sustainable. And why do we have this styrofoam packaging all over us? Something like that. So I think it's just like, how do we take step by step in our own different areas of uh, life? Because together we can kind of come together. So hopefully that kind of answered your question. I don't really know about student advocacy in terms of the curriculum. I think maybe inviting speakers to come out um, for these classes might be good, or even just promoting more sustainable clubs. I know they're starting to do that recently, but often I find a lot of people come out to my clubs kind of just based off of word of mouth or Instagram, not because um, besides here, like a couple classes, maybe like that Joan Welch leads, like might say, oh, go to veg out, but that's about it. And it's like, it would be great to see finance classes promoting like the stuff of the investment group and the sustainable ETF, stuff like that. So maybe just more awareness of these uh, student organizations. So thank you for your question. Uh, Brad, do you have a question? I, I wanted uh, to know that um, we're a little past 1250. And for those people who need to leave right now, um, please feel free. Uh, if Josh, you're available to answer yeah, another question or two, um, we'll continue. Uh, all right, any other questions? Uh, I've been looking, no, no others. Yeah. Do you have a question? Well, sure. So I know you wanted to divert the discussion away from your own personal journey, but I'm curious as to more details of your comfortable sharing about your transformation. Yeah, sure. I mean, I'm, 
I don't know if it worked. I mean, uh, yeah. So the question was, um, and also Brad said, if you don't want to see me anymore, feel free to hop off. It's all right. <laughs> but I'm, I, I'm free all day. I yeah, I think it is. Uh, I don't know. Um, so Walt said, uh, just more kind of question about my personal journey on that transformation. Um, some of it did start with kind of just uh, open dialogue about the issue, but I actually, uh, I've always tried to be very rational. Um, so I try and think of, say, whether it was religion or it was, uh, you know, how, uh, what makes the most sense. In, you know, sixth grade, I found myself, you know, not in, say, like the shape I wanted to be. I didn't eat sugar for a year because I heard, oh, it's good to do. Uh, maybe that wasn't the best thing to do. But it all goes to say, in kind of like 10th grade year or something, I would see the health benefits of a plant-based diet and how science shows that, oh, it helps hypertension. I'm like, not that I had hypertension or anything. I was just like a young punk playing volleyball or something. I was like, oh, if it can help this person, I don't want a heart disease or something. I'm going to go plant-based. And then, so I was a vegetarian for a, a few months and then fully vegan. So it started off with health because of how it's rational. Then, oh, it's why do we decide to eat different animals over, you know, another or why in different nations do they do that? And it's, oh, it, this is really good for the environment. I don't really know much about carbon output or your carbon footprint, but I mean, I guess it's good to eat beans instead of a big juicy steak or something, and it will help uh, water use and stuff like that. Is that going to help me lead into that? And then because I kind of came into that fold, I kind of came into other environmental issues and realized that, okay, there's these other environmental issues that are important, but also, you know, why, like, why do we have certain like preconceived notions about you know, different people of like color or economic status or like gender or something? And then it kind of just like, so it, was, it wasn't like a one thing that someone's like, ah, oh, like, beat me up or something, go sustainability minded or something. It was kind of just like a journey over time. And I will say, I mean, while that's a very different person, it's still me. And, you know, I'm not going to say like, I wasn't entirely proud of who I was at the time, because I still did a lot and I still helped people, but it was just in a different way. And then, so here I am today. So hopefully that kind of answers your question, but also just, I mean, just my, I've only been here basically a little over three semesters and the time here, has really helped to mold me who I am, who I want to be as well, and who I want to be for the future. I came in thinking, oh, I'll just be a financial analyst, work with Excel all day, hate my life or something. And but now I'm like, oh, alternative protein, and it led me to work with a venture capitalist, and we just launched a vegan poached egg in Los Angeles, and oh, I want to make this my career, and oh, maybe cultivated meat is really awesome, and you know, how can we have meat without having to kill an animal? It's just it's step by step by step by step, and it just keeps going. But it's also those connections. I wouldn't have any of this in my future career without that one conversation that with uh, Dr. Tobin, which was a result of students against food insecurity. And that's why I kind of said your journey is kind of like it's gonna be a little crazy, but you just gotta embrace it. So hopefully that kind of makes sense in an abstract way. Um, but yeah, it really I became more sustainable when I cut off all my hair because it's like a better answer or something. I, uh, uh, any other questions? We got on Zoom here uh, in person. We're, I know we're almost at one. I appreciate everyone for uh, staying on. We are at one o'clock. We're so at one. Thank you very much, Josh. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. For YouTube family, please watch. Uh, link.